everybody. So we are less than a week away from Nintendo's E3 Direct presentation, and almost certainly when we're going to get our next Super Smash Bros. Ultimate Fighter revealed to us. So first off, before we talk E3 and Smash speculation, elephant in the room, where the heck is the rumored Switch Pro announcement? People were claiming that it could happen before E3. So that whole thing stemmed from this Bloomberg report. Lots of people started backing it up, or at least saying it was possible. Well, still nothing. The Nintendo tweets seem to be taunting us in how mundane they've been, with everyone expecting a Super Nintendo Switch upgraded model announcement, and instead we get stuff like this. And at this point, it seems pretty unlikely there's time left for such a big announcement with less than a week until Nintendo's E3 Direct. The Nintendo of America tweet about the Direct specified Nintendo's E3 presentation would focus on software. So that would indicate games and not some new console announcement, as that would be called hardware. I don't think anyone's really at fault here for believing there might be a Switch Pro that could get announced before E3. Bloomberg is probably right about an upgraded Switch happening, and no one seems certain of exactly when that was going to get announced anyway. People were just saying it was possible it would happen before E3. So after a lot of hype for a possible Switch Pro happening, some likely fake renders being posted around the internet, and counting down every single hour in hopes that an announcement could happen, it looks like we're just going to have to be patient on this one. But an upgraded Switch is still likely happening, but when that's actually going to get announced and we'll really get a look at it, who knows? I guess we'll just have to wait this one out. Anyway, who really needs a system upgrade when we are currently standing on the edge overlooking a massive amount of gaming news in the very, very near future? E3 itself is only days away, and we now have the full lineup of when we'll see presentations from a ton of big gaming companies. Here's a brief lineup of the E3 schedule. June 12th is Ubisoft and Gearbox. June 13th is Microsoft plus Bethesda, Square Enix, Warner Bros. slash Back for Blood, PC Gaming Show. June 14th is Take Two and Capcom. And June 15th is Nintendo and Bandai Namco. Delizzy over on Twitter wrote Namco and Nintendo on the same day. So we now know Bandai Namco and Nintendo share the same E3 day for their presentations. With Smash speculation in mind, could this possibly be good news for the likelihood of a Bandai Namco character possibly being revealed as part of our Smash DLC? Maybe a Smash character reveal from a Bandai Namco franchise could lead into the Bandai Namco presentation, and they could talk about the fighter being announced there for some game that fighter's from or something being talked about in their presentation. It could all tie in. Steve was announced right before Minecon, and Sakurai's presentation was basically the opening to Minecon. So it's not unprecedented for something like this to happen, where a character gets revealed and another presentation happens, more focused on that character's game series, and Smash was sort of tied into it. And we are still missing the Lloyd Mii costume. It's our final Smash 4 third-party Mii costume to be missing, and with Bandai Namco literally working on Smash Ultimate itself, it's a near certainty that Lloyd will return to Smash Bros. Ultimate, but in what form? That's the question. It seems like a bit of a coin toss whether or not Lloyd's going to show back up as a Mii costume or as a playable fighter, but it seems almost certain he will show up in some form. While I think many people out there are going to groan at the idea of getting another anime sword fighter character, a Tales of Rep is a possibility for sure. The series is very popular in Japan, and Lloyd specifically has been a big part of Smash speculation since back during the Brawl days. We also have yet to get a tournament event for characters that use swords. So with Lloyd's Mii costume missing and no sword event, I do honestly think we should brace ourselves for the high potential of another sword user getting in Smash. Well, I do think A Tales of Rep is a somewhat tough sell as an E3 reveal all alone for Western audiences. If we got something like a double reveal, someone like Lloyd being this E3's equivalent to when we got Hero revealed could make sense. If you put Lloyd next to someone that maybe caters more to the Western audience, it could work as a good double reveal. Of course, that's just me speculating. Even if we just get a single fighter, it still could potentially be a Tales of Rep. People should brace for that. And with Bandai Namco in mind, there are of course other options that could come from that company. Other characters from things like Dark Souls, like Chosen Undead, or characters from Soul Calibur, like Nightmare. Those are other possibilities, and both characters I just mentioned would also fit as another sword user. Of course, all that said, having Bandai Namco's E3 event on the same day as Nintendo's doesn't guarantee a character is going to come from Bandai Namco. In fact, it's sort of reaching speculation to think that's the case. There are, of course, lots of other big companies already involved in Smash Bros. Ultimate who are also showing up at E3. Companies like Microsoft, Capcom, and Square Enix. Square's event image here gives me really strong Persona 5 vibes. 
Soul Merce on my Discord wrote, Persona 5 Royal on Xbox? Microsoft Singapore in Korea appears to have raided Persona 5 Royal in September of 2020, which would seem to imply an Xbox release is potentially coming. Could this perhaps be announced at Microsoft's E3? It should be noted, however, that the rating was from nine months ago, and for some reason the DLC is rated A, which is their equivalent to E. It also spells Persona out in English, unlike the P5R rating for PS4, so it's a bit odd, but certainly significant. And speaking of the Persona series, we had a huge leak for Shin Megami Tensei V. This leak included its release date, which is November 11th, apparently. Basically, the official Japanese website for the game was accidentally updated with a ton of information about the game. I'm not going to go into all the details of it in this video, but feel free to go check out the translation and read about it for yourself if you're interested. Considering this leak happened, it probably means we'll hear some more news about SMT5 at Nintendo's E3 event. Maybe even Demi Fiend being a Smash rep. That could sort of tie into the hype of a new entry in the series. We did get that random Sophia Spirit added to Smash, which shows Atlas is still on board with Smash Ultimate. Could another Atlas rep be happening? Well, whatever the case, we'll find out soon enough. And E3 isn't even the only big gaming event happening right now. There's another big gaming event happening this week. Jeff Keighley's Summer Game Fest is happening again this year. Last year, E3 was canceled, and instead, Summer Game Fest was really where we had all of our big game announcements and gaming news. It had multiple things announced, and it spread it out over several months. And this year, Summer Game Fest is back, and is sort of the lead-in to all the E3 presentations. And of course, Summer Game Fest itself promises to have plenty of news and gaming content, including new game announcements. Yeah, this coming week is about to be absolutely insane with gaming news. Jeff Keighley is the host of Summer Game Fest, and he's mostly known for running the Game Awards. And at last year's Game Awards, we had Sephiroth revealed, and back in 2018, the Game Awards had Joker revealed. With a confirmed date for our Nintendo E3 Direct presentation, June 15th, I'm sure that is where our next Smash Fighter reveal is going to be. But still, Jeff Keighley has been involved with Smash Ultimate character reveals twice before. So, when Jeff recently did an Ask Me Anything on Reddit, something he wrote caught a lot of people's attention. Officer Otter on Twitter wrote, Could this be Jeff just toying with us? Or to get us ready for something... Dot, dot, dot. And then the Reddit AMA says, What is Crash Bandicoot like to work with? And Jeff responded, Honestly, he's a dream. He smashes his lines every time. So obviously using the word smash there is really suspicious. He smashes his lines every time is an awfully odd phrase to use. Now, whether Jeff is just kidding around or actually hinting at Crash in Smash, I don't know. But I figured it was worth mentioning as Jeff Keighley is one of the few people who might actually know about future Smash fighters, since he's been involved with revealing some of them in the past at the Game Awards. I should point out that a lot of people took Jeff's whoa comment as a hint towards Crash being the character reveal when we got Sephiroth. So maybe he's just trolling us and likes Crash. Either way, at the very least, we probably shouldn't be reading so much in the comments like this. Will Crash be our E3 reveal? I don't know. There's certainly been a lot of interesting evidence he could show up in Smash. And it's his series 25th anniversary. But evidence and anniversaries don't always result in a character actually getting in Smash. There is a new glitch that was just noticed by SSB over on Twitter, and here's the glitch in action. It involves the Ice Climbers, who do have a spin attack, and of course Crash would likely have some kind of spin attack. But as always, basing any predictions for characters based on glitches we have is very hypothetical speculation, so be warned not to read too much into glitches. Even if a glitch has resulted due to them building some unreleased future fighter, figuring out which fighter that could actually be that's causing that glitch seems to be nearly impossible without the help of hindsight. So take this weird Ice Climbers glitch with a grain of salt. All right, now I want to talk about our latest Smash event because there's surprisingly a lot of speculation surrounding this one. It's a fire-themed tournament, and the translation reads, Tournament event, Burning Flame Uzumaku Tournament, will be held for three days from 6-11 Friday. This is a tournament that only fighters with the deadly skill of fire can participate. Burn up in a hot fight. The more you win, the more luxurious spirits you get. So this event involves characters with fire-based special attacks. Non-special attacks that still have a fire mechanic to them, such as Steve's down tilt, don't count. 
So that's why characters like him aren't here. It has to be a special attack that is fire-based. And apparently explosions don't count as fire-based attacks either, as characters like Snake who have explosion specials like grenades and stuff, they're not on here either. So if you subscribe to the idea that they'd probably hold off on a fire-themed tournament until after a fire-themed character got in, this one probably isn't good news for characters like Cinderace's chances. However, that's just scratching the surface for what's going on with this tournament event. The really interesting part involves how these tournaments are numbered, and this one is actually out of order. So I've gone over this stuff before, but just to briefly explain it again, all of these Smash events update posts are actually stored on a website. And if you open up the images for the events, the URL for the images are in numerical order. Spirit events are numbered a certain way, tournament events are numbered a different way, and so on. The point being, they generally are posted in order of their numbering. But every once in a while, one is missing, and they get posted out of order. So let me read you some speculation I was sent. I found something kind of strange regarding the fire theme tournament. It's labeled as 4013. The last tournament was 4048. The 4014 tournament occurred in February 2020, over a year ago. It seems like they postponed the fire tournament for some reason and added Sephiroth and Pyra slash Mithra to it. The tournament was originally supposed to come out a few weeks after Byleth released. I think they postponed it after deciding the characters for Fighter Pass 2. They waited until all characters who can use fire, Sephiroth and Pyra, were released before doing the tournament. Okay, so this tournament event has a numbering, 4013, that was skipped over a year ago, back around the time of Byleth's reveal, and it's just showing up now. The speculation is they originally would have posted it after Byleth, but decided to instead skip it and hold it off so that the tournament could include a few other fighters that had fire-based special attacks, specifically Sephiroth and Pyra. So potentially when Pass 2 was decided and they had a couple characters with fire attacks in mind, they chose to hold off on the fire tournament so those characters could participate in it. Which if we believe that theory could mean the remaining Smash Fighters won't have fire-based special moves. Why else hold off on this event for over a year if you're just going to put it out there and still have a character that uses a fire attack happening later on? Okay, pretty interesting, but there is a bit of a problem with this theory. We've had tournament events happen where future unreleased fighters could have been included in those tournaments. So why didn't they hold off on doing those events? Why would this fire event be held off to include Pyra and Sephiroth when a few other events happened despite future unannounced fighters being eligible to participate had they held them off? Why weren't those events held off too? I'm not positive why, but I could certainly make a guess at a few of them. For instance, had Sephiroth been revealed, he could have been part of the Lightweights tournament. But instead, they went ahead and did the lightweight tournament before Sephiroth happened, instead of holding off on it so he could be included. Well, the weight of a fighter, I imagine, is a big part of balancing a fighter and probably isn't certain until towards the end of developing that character. Maybe they simply weren't sure if Sephiroth would be a super lightweight or not, and they didn't know that in time to hold off the tournament. Whereas knowing Sephiroth would have a fire attack was something they knew as soon as Pass 2 was decided and Sephiroth was on there. And thus the fire event was held off, but the lightweight event stayed on the schedule. They weren't sure what Sephiroth's weight would be. They were still developing the fighter, and the weight of a fighter is a big part of balancing, and it's probably not certain till towards the end. Another tournament that could have involved Sephiroth was the 90s event, but perhaps they figured if they mysteriously held off from holding one of the events based on a decade of gaming, it would be suspicious, and essentially reveal that a 90s fighter was happening at some point, so they kept it on schedule instead of holding off on it, which might reveal a 90s fighter. On that note though, we still haven't had a 2010s tournament. But maybe that's just too modern. Maybe they're not really going to celebrate it as a decade of gaming because it's basically current. Anyway, it's certainly possible this fire-themed tournament event was held off when Pass 2 was decided so that they could include the fighters in Pass 2 that used fire-based special attacks. And with that possibility in mind, it's worth noting we are actually still missing another tournament event. Back in late August, early September of 2020, we skipped tournament event number 4029, and we still haven't gotten it. This was right around the time of the Mario 35th Anniversary Direct, though we have gotten a Mario tournament event, but it was back during Pass 1. Hard to say if the missing event involved Mario stuff, just because it was planned to happen around the time of the Mario 35th Direct. Especially with the pandemic and everything, the Mario 35th Direct was probably not even on schedule itself. 
But if the missing tournament event did involve Mario stuff in some way, perhaps a Mario character is happening, and so the event was held off. Although, unlike the fire event, which would have happened around the time of Byleth, this event was scheduled several months into Fighter Pass 2 already. Again, it would have taken place in early September of 2020. Considering the Fighter Pass 2 characters get tournament events for themselves after they've been revealed, and their tournament events aren't out of order in any way, this missing event must have initially been in order alongside the Pass 2 character events, and then it was decided to be skipped during Pass 2 itself. The fire event being around the time of Byleth makes sense to potentially skip it. Maybe it was initially part of Pass 1, and when Pass 2 was decided, they skipped it and held it off, and that makes sense. But skipping one in the middle of Pass 2 is just a little strange. I can really only think of two reasons an event might be chosen to get skipped that far into Pass 2. Number one, the first possibility is they decided they'd add a secret bonus fighter around that time frame. And the bonus fighter fit for whatever tournament event that was, so they decided to skip it and hold it off, and it will return when a bonus fighter is revealed. Skipping an event that happened between Pass 1 and Pass 2 makes sense when you're adding more fighters, but to skip an event in the middle of Pass 2 without having some new fighter added to the development side of things doesn't really make sense. But if there's a bonus fighter and it was decided around then, then yeah, another fighter was added to development and thus they skipped another tournament event. And again, if the event did have anything to do with the Mario series because of the Mario 35th Direct that happened around that time, Obviously, Waluigi fits pretty good for this theory. But I'm also completely aware people are very wary of speculating about the possibility of a bonus fighter even happening, which I totally understand and agree it's a dangerous thing to speculate on and to start expecting, so we really shouldn't expect a bonus fighter at all. Well, the other possibility for why maybe a tournament event was skipped is more plausible. So number two is the event involved a move a Pass 2 fighter will have, but the fighter's move set hadn't been decided until a bit into Pass 2's development, so the fighter being eligible for the tournament event wasn't known until a ways into developing that fighter in Pass 2. So they only ended up holding off the event when they knew that this fighter would actually fit for it because of some move they decided to give the fighter. An example would be something like having an ice-themed special move tournament event. And let's say Dante was chosen as part of Pass 2, but his moveset wasn't decided upon initially, and later on, after fleshing out what his moveset would be, he uses an ice-themed attack. Simply having Dante chosen as part of Pass 2 wouldn't make him an obvious candidate for an ice-themed tournament event. It wasn't until after his moveset was decided upon that the tournament event happened to fit for him, and they decided to hold off on it. Again, that's just an example. Of course, all this stuff I'm talking about, these skipped tournament events, is highly speculative stuff. But I can't think of why else one of these tournament events would have been skipped. Especially one that initially would have happened a year ago, way before Sephiroth and Pyro were revealed, and now those characters are part of that tournament event. Really seems like they did hold off on it to include those fighters. As for Tournament Event 4029, we'll have to keep an eye out for when that one shows up, and then we might have a better idea in hindsight of why that one was skipped. Alright, so the big thing I've seen everybody talking about lately is surprisingly some Doomguy speculation. It's been a while since Doomguy was discussed for Smash, but all of a sudden he's showing back up in Smash speculation. This all started with Josh over on Twitter, who posted a video of a Doom Eternal TV ad with Lifelight playing over it. Lifelight being the theme song for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. As you can see in this post, they hate Smash speculation. So I actually had to pose as a Smash speculation hater myself to infiltrate and gather more information. Nah, I'm just kidding around. They just said they hate how the community can get really toxic, which is completely fair and valid. Honestly, it gets pretty toxic sometimes. Anyway, I talked to Josh, and they explained that they post the video every Monday, and for some reason, now when they posted it, it got taken down on Twitter. Specifically, posting on Twitter caused it to get removed. They aren't sure if this is like Nintendo or Bethesda removing it, or if the video just hits some sort of weird algorithm thing and it causes it to get taken down by Twitter. They're a fan of Doomguy getting in Smash, of course, that's why they posted the video in the first place, so they are hopeful it could be good news for Doomguy's chances in Smash. Also, they made this image supporting Doomguy, and they're now working on some Smash animations, so that's pretty cool. Anyway, that stuff aside, this one got a bunch of attention. Especially with things being so close to E3, people are really wondering if the reason the video got taken down was because Doomguy could be showing up in Smash soon, so maybe Nintendo's on the lookout for these types of videos and taking them down. 
I, Flash Boy, did an experiment with Life Light, and the song itself doesn't get removed. So it appears it's not just some copyright with the Life Light song that's causing this to get removed. However, Matthew Graphics wrote, This content is unavailable, or this video has been deleted, usually shows up when the video was manually deleted by the uploader or by Twitter. The former is something you can easily do through the media studio. If it was a copyright takedown, it would display this instead. This media has been disabled in response to a report by the copyright owner. So with that in mind, I'm uncertain if this is some weird Twitter algorithm takedown or an actual copyright removal or what. Regardless though, it doesn't matter much as we've seen past instances of this sort of music takedown scenario happen for other characters and it's gone both ways. A Banjo-Kazooie song got a copyright strike and we ended up getting Banjo in Smash. There were some Mario RPG tracks that also got copyright strikes from specifically Nintendo, and yet Gino is just a me costume, and no music tracks were added to Smash with him. So even if this was a copyright strike from Nintendo, it might not mean anything for Smash Bros. Sometimes we've gotten those and just nothing has happened. Funny I'm talking about Doom Guy and Gino all of a sudden. If somehow Kako Melo turned out to be real and we got Doom Guy and the Gino me was like just a fake out and it got upgraded, that would be such a crazy ending for Smash Ultimate, but I don't think that's going to happen at this point. It is a little strange at this point that the person who made Kako Melo hasn't come forward and just shown more footage of their mod. Everybody basically believes it's a mod, so it is a little surprising they haven't actually just taken credit for it. Anyway, regardless of Kako Melo being totally fake, Doom Slayer is still a possibility, of course. We did have that id interview with Marty Stratton that seemed to deconfirm Doom Guy, but with Grant Kirkhope's don't hold your breath for banjo comment, we really can never be certain with these deconfirming interviews. The characters are still possible. The interviews could just be deflection. And after all, Bethesda is in Smash with the Vault Boy Me costume and only the Vault Boy Me costume, which is kind of strange for a big company like Bethesda. Though I suppose you could argue if Doomguy was happening, they'd hold off revealing Bethesda was involved in Smash at all. It might be the smarter move not to let us know Bethesda's involved and then give us Doomguy down the road. That would be better to just reveal that all at once as a big surprise. Although maybe after the SNK leak, they decided not to risk having a company's copyright in Smash get leaked again. So they gave us some Bethesda content early, so if Bethesda showed up in a Smash copyright, it wouldn't draw any suspicions. And Bethesda is now owned by Microsoft, and at this point I personally think if we got a first-person shooter Space Marine in Smash, it'd probably be Master Chief. I just think Nintendo and Microsoft are so close lately, and if Microsoft had a chance to negotiate another Smash fighter, they'd probably want to promote their mascot character who has a highly anticipated new game coming out at the end of the year. But frankly, whether we got Master Chief or Doom Slayer in Smash, I'd be extremely excited with either character. Getting either one would be an absolute miracle, I'd go nuts. And while we're on the subject of Smash characters we've been speculating that might happen throughout all of this DLC speculation stuff, we might as well talk about Ryo Hayabusa. Something really interesting was noticed by VG Squirrel. They wrote, this clearly means nothing, but Nintendo's E3 presentation takes place on Ryo Hayabusa's in-game birthday. Now he has to be revealed. Would Nintendo really upset Hayabusa on his birthday? They went on to say, I brought it up as more of a fun coincidence than anything. And then when I gave them credit over on Twitter when I posted about it, they said, oh, thank you, but I've got to be honest, I saw it on YouTube in this video's comment section. So shout out to Dusty Dupree in the comment section. So anyway, yeah, Ryu Hayabusa's birthday, as in the birthday within the game the fictional character supposedly has, is actually June 15th, which is the date of Nintendo's E3 Nintendo Direct presentation. So if the fighter we got at E3 was Ryu Hayabusa, he'd be getting into Smash on his birthday. While speculating about the anniversary of games has pretty much never worked out, this would be the first time I've heard people speculating for a character's in-game birthday having anything to do with a possible reveal date. Now I should note we have had things happen that did coincide with Smash reveals, such as Minecon happening a few days after Steve's reveal, or the Final Fantasy VII Remake being up for awards at the Game Awards, and that's where we got Sephiroth revealed. But if Ryu Hayabusa did happen to get revealed for Smash on the 15th, it would almost certainly be a happy coincidence that it was also his in-game birthday. I seriously doubt E3 dates can possibly be planned far enough in advance for a Fighter Pass character's birthday to coincide with the date, or to be planned to coincide with the date. Still, it would be pretty cool. 
Also worth noting, the Dead or Alive Twitter page has been celebrating these in-game birthdays over the last year or so, which is kind of interesting. Ryo Hayabusa is a part of Dead or Alive. Anyway, it's just funny to me to be speculating Hayabusa and Doomguy still, as they were part of probably the first fake DLC leak we had for Smash Ultimate's DLC. The 5chan leak way back shortly after Joker was revealed. And here we are, days away from E3 2021, Still speculating these two characters. Would be pretty cool if one of them actually got into Smash by the end of all this. As for characters people have more recently started speculating for Smash, we still have that Donald Mustard, Jeff Keighley Zoom call where Donald Mustard said he couldn't comment about Fortnite and Smash. Maybe Jonesy could show up as an E3 reveal. We learned a bunch of information from the Epic Games vs. Apple court case about potential characters that were considered for Fortnite. One of those characters was Samus Aran from Metroid. That was the only Nintendo character that was in that big document of considered characters for Fortnite. A lot of people have speculated maybe Samus could get revealed for Fortnite at E3, while Jonesy gets revealed for Smash, kind of a double crossover. Well, over on Twitter, Sheena BR, a known Fortnite leaker, wrote this. Sources tell me that a Metroid, Samus Aran, collaboration will not happen next season. Apparently, Epic wasn't able to obtain the rights to put her in the game. And then I've seen this rumor floating around that says apparently Nintendo said they'd only agree if Samus was only purchasable and seeable on Switch and on other platforms it would display the default skin. Epic obviously denied their requests. So maybe all the stuff about trying to get Samus to show up in Fortnite is something that just never actually materialized. It seems like negotiations, I guess, didn't work out. Over on Smashboards, Ayumi Tachibana wrote, While I don't believe this 4chan PSO2 ARCS leak, but the other leak, also 4chan, says Matoi is in consideration is kind of growing in the Japanese speculation scene. The leak itself isn't taken seriously, of course, but people are interested in the idea of PSO2 content making the cut in Smash, which sounds weirdly plausible since the series is so tied with Sakurai's personal history. PSO2 is the moneymaker of Sega today, and PSO2 NGS is right around the corner. So it is kind of understandable it'll get chosen as the next Sega rep over Puyo Puyo or Yakuza, since both series have their issues to get in Smash. Then they posted a tweet from Fantasy Star Online 2, which celebrated Smash Ultimate. And then they said, Seems like this is the only verified official company account not directly involved with Smash Ultimate, but still celebrated the release of it. Remember, there was one team that also celebrated the heck out of it when Smash Ultimate released, even on their official streams multiple times, despite not involved with it at all for some unknown reason. Dragon Quest. So they briefly mentioned that Matoi 4chan leak, so here's that one if you want to pause and look at it. Anyway, very interesting, the PSO2 Twitter celebrated the release of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. In a very similar way, Dragon Quest also celebrated Smash, and of course, we eventually got Hero in Smash. Considering how big Fantasy Star Online 2 is in Japan, I'm not that surprised Japanese Smash fans are talking about it now. It is a sleeper pick to look out for, for sure. In other Smash-related news, Among Us did a sort of parody Smash reveal trailer for Tan being added to the game. Sakurai has commented about Among Us before, so maybe Among Us content could come to Smash Ultimate in some form. I don't know, like a spirit event or something. There's a rumor right now about a potential My Hero Academia fighting game similar to Dragon Ball Fighter Z. I've only watched the first season of My Hero Academia, but I did really enjoy that first season. I kind of want to watch the rest of it, actually. Dragon Ball Fighter Z is a really awesome Dragon Ball series fighter game, so it would be really cool to see the same treatment for My Hero Academia. I think My Hero Academia fans would be pretty excited about that if it turned out to be true. Arc System Works getting a Smash Fighter is also a possibility that I rarely seem to get a chance to talk about. While I don't think a Dragon Ball Z or My Hero Academia anime character is going to show up in Smash, there was an Arc System Works spirit event for the River City game series. So they are involved with Smash already, so who knows, maybe they could get some sort of playable character in Smash at some point here. Soul Bad Guy is usually the front runner when talking about Arc System reps, but if this fire event really counts out characters with fire-based special moves, he probably isn't very likely now. And I don't know if someone like Soul Bad Guy would be a very hype reveal for the majority of gamers. I figure a character like that would be a lot like Terry, where they're slightly lesser known to the more casual gamer crowd. And I'm unsure if E3 is the place for a character with that level of popularity to get revealed. But with that statement said, of course, admittedly, there's no rules saying E3 has to be a big hype reveal. It could be a fairly mundane one and it might very well be even a first-party character or something. It doesn't even have to be a third-party character. 
we have gotten first party characters revealed at E3 events. Ridley, Palatina, Villager, all first party characters revealed at E3. So despite spending basically this entire video speculating about hype third party fighters, it is completely possible we could get a first party character or a third party character that isn't particularly hype. I'd actually strongly suggest we lower our expectations just in case something like that is what we get. I'm usually much more of a hype man for Smash stuff, but I think going into this E3 with the possibility of a first party character or a not insanely hype character anyway, it might be a smart idea to lower our expectations. I'm going to suggest people do that. Again, not usually what I suggest. I'm usually more of a hype guy, but I think this E3, it might be smart to lower expectations. With the idea of first party fighters though, there are still some very cool first party fighters that I'd personally be really hyped to actually get. Though I can never shake the feeling that if this E3 does happen to have a heavy focus on something like Breath of the Wild 2, we could get something like Breath of the Wild 2 Zelda. For whatever reason, that character is just stuck in my mind. I have no idea, that's just speculation, but I'm bracing for the possibility. And I strongly suggest everyone else braces for their worst case scenario. Also, on the subject of Breath of the Wild 2, there has been a recent leak about GameStop doubling up on staff for the 15th. GameStops have received Zelda posters to give out for something on the 15th, but they don't know what exactly yet. Now, I don't think many people are doubting this, but because of this poster and supposedly doubling up on the 15th, I think it almost certainly confirms we'll see Zelda stuff at E3. Hopefully Breath of the Wild 2 info and possibly even pre-orders going live on the 15th. That's just my speculation though. All right, well, with all that said, I'm very excited for Nintendo's E3 and I'm excited for the week of gaming news that lies before us here. With this video published, if you've been following my videos, you should be all caught up with Smash speculation stuff up until this point. A lot of people have asked if I'll do an E3 speculation video, like a video speculating what I think will happen at Nintendo's E3 and which Smash character or characters we might get, who I'm basically predicting, and which games I predict we might see or what I'd like to see at Nintendo's E3 this year or something. Because we'll likely get non-stop gaming news every day from here on out, I don't think I'll make a structured E3 predictions video like that. Don't hold me to that, I might change my mind and end up making one. But I feel a video like that would just be me repeating all the same speculation points for all these same characters that I've been talking about for months and months already here. You can just watch my old videos and get that same speculation. And since it wouldn't be any new speculation for those characters, it would just kind of be me compiling all the stuff I've been saying for a bunch of characters, I just feel like you can just watch the old videos if you want to see that same speculation. Those type of very structured, very edited Smash speculation videos, like the one you're watching right now, often take me several days to make. And I just don't think it would really be all that necessary or productive to spend a bunch of time planning another one out and editing it and everything just to end up repeating all that content you can watch in my past videos. Just so that it's all in one video happening before E3. I just don't see the point in doing that. So instead, my plan going forward in the lead up to Nintendo's E3 presentation is to do more organic on the fly style content. Something like doing a podcast where I discuss my E3 predictions with other people. That's more organic and I can do it on the fly. I don't have to structure it all out. I can just talk about what's on my mind in an open discussion. Or possibly I might do some streams. I could stream some of the E3 events that happen in the days prior to Nintendo's E3. The E3 events that are in the lead up to Nintendo's E3, like the Xbox event or the Capcom event, and just talk and chat about my thoughts for what might happen at Nintendo's E3. I think that more interactive and fluid content is better than trying to structure out some video, take up a bunch of time getting it all prepared, and just have it end up being the same repeated speculation anyway. And trying to structure, edit, and plan out some video while all the gaming news is flooding in and speculation I'm sure is going wild, it's probably just going to slow everything down. It'd probably be much quicker to just stream or do a podcast or something where I just talk about what my thoughts are. 
Now, if something really major happens, like let's say there's like a big leak on Saturday or something, and it's just like the talk of everything until E3, is this character actually going to happen? Is this leak real? If something like that happened, I might do a shorter, focused video entirely on whatever that hypothetical, important Smash speculation moment would have been. Whatever that would be, that hypothetical leak or something like that, I'd do a focused video just on that if something really big happened. But barring any major leak type situation, I think doing a podcast and then just doing streaming style content for the rest of the week is the easiest way to keep up with the pace of all the gaming news and to just give you my thoughts instead of trying to structure it all out. Doing the videos as more of a discussion rather than a planned thing is probably going to be better for explaining what I think Nintendo's E3 might be like as we approach it anyway. Obviously, I'll stream Nintendo's E3 and the Smash reveal that'll probably happen there. And then afterwards, I'll make my usual After Smash Speculation Roundup style structured video. But in this hectic week leading up to the Nintendo Direct on June 15th that we're about to have, I think I'll be opting to make content I can do on the fly. I hope everybody's cool with that. All right, well, exciting times coming up. If you guys have any thoughts or comments about anything I talked about in this video, leave them below. Remember to like the video, leave a comment in the section below, and subscribe to Papa Gino's a Twitter, a Patreon, a Discord.